Hello and welcome. My name is Raj K and today I'm going to be taking you through this beast. This is Canon's latest and greatest full frame mirrorless camera, the EOS R3. This video is going to be a bit of a deep dive, so I'm going to take you through the entire menu system, uh, show you some of the ergonomic differences and features on the body. And I'm not going to be going through too much about spec um, because there's a lot of content out there already about that. So grab yourself a cup of tea, get comfy, and let's get to it. Oh, I needed that. I did recently do a similar video on the EOS R5, and while there are some similarities between the two cameras, so there will be some overlap, there's quite a lot of new stuff to go through on this as well. While I'm going through it all, I will show you some of my favorite ways to set the camera up and some top tips to get the best out of this new system. I've got an overhead camera, which will be pointing down at the um, R3. Hopefully it'll be nice and clear for you. So we'll start with the ergonomics and we'll start at the top of the camera. On the top of the camera, you'll notice that it's quite similar to a 1D series, but you don't have uh, the mode button over here and you do have a new dial at the top there. We have an information panel here, um, it's pretty different to a 1DX series camera um, but very much similar to a 5 series camera and you're able to cycle through the information that it shows. Hopefully you can see that on the overhead camera I have. And if you hold the button the light comes on. Uh, we have exposure compensation button there and on the left hand side we have the drive and autofocus um, and you just tap that and use the uh, dials to pick your settings. Similarly with the flash compensation and metering button, you can adjust the, press the button and adjust them using the dials. So here you see there's flash exposure compensation. Obviously the camera doesn't have a flash built in similar to uh, any full frame Canon mirrorless camera or any full frame Canon camera for that matter. But we do have a hot shoe here. So the hot shoe is a little bit different to any Canon camera before. Um, in that it has a new set of little pins just at the back, which is very hard to see. Yeah, no, it's very hard to see, but there are a set of little uh, pins there that allow connection to new accessories. Um, so this is one of the big changes. You'll notice that the uh, hot shoe has a dedicated uh, little rubber seal on it. With the rubber seal, this camera is fully weather sealed to a similar level to a 1DX kind of body. Um, without it, it's not as weather sealed as a 1DX. So it's important to remember not to lose that. The hot shoe can take new accessories, but is also fully compatible with all previous accessories. The only caveat to that is that if you want the flashes, Canon flashes to be weather sealed, like the 600EX um, series of flashes, it has a little rubber seal around it. That doesn't fit nice on this new hot shoe with the rubber seal. So you can just take that off and put it on. Or you can use an adapter, which is sold separately, um, to adapt the hot shoe over to fit with the weather sealing as well. So the new set of pins there allow you to use accessories that don't need batteries because they're powered from the camera directly. For example, there is a new wireless flash transmitter to take the place of the STE3 uh, flash transmitter. It's much, much smaller. And all it has on there is a little button that you press to bring up the menu um, on changing flash settings. And everything is controlled then on the back screen. The transmitter doesn't have any batteries. It's one less thing to go wrong and it's small enough that you can leave it on most of the time. It's an absolutely brilliant little accessory. There are others as well. So there's microphones and there'll be plenty more coming in the future, I'm sure. So moving on, we have, uh, as I said, we've got a new dial here that goes with the mode button. So the mode button's up there. To change the mode, you just slide across. If you want to change the video on this camera, it is slightly different in that you don't press the information button to switch to video. There's a dedicated little toggle here, which you switch over and it goes into video mode. It does, however, switch to custom three if you just hit the record button while you're in stills mode. And uh, to go into that a little bit more in depth, if you set up the camera to the settings you want in video mode, and save those settings to your custom three uh, custom mode, you can hit the record button at any time while you're shooting stills and it will revert back to custom three. 
That way you have your settings saved and it's ready to record roughly in the right settings because you've set them up yourself. I'll go into custom modes a little bit more in detail later on in the video. So obviously with this um, dial, it does allow you a little bit more flexibility for having all your different variables on different dials. So you have one here, which I use for shutter speed. I use this one for ISO, and then you've got the back dial for your aperture. Of course, with the RF lenses, you do also have the option of having uh, one of those variables on the front ring, but that can now also be for other things like white balance. Um, shutter button on the front, and then you've got a manual function button, which is also customizable. Near enough, all the buttons I show you, uh, or a great deal of them, are customizable. So if you want to set this camera up for a way that works for you, you can do that, and I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, on to the side. So you'll notice we have, uh, you might not be able to see, but there's a new rubberized grip um, texture, which is quite different from any camera that's come before. I quite like it. Um, it's really comfortable in the hand. The whole camera is actually. And then we have a little flick to open um, card door, similar to a uh, R5. And in there we have a CF Express and an SD card slot. The SD card slot is UHS-2 compatible, so you can use the faster cards. And of course we have the CF Express card slot, which is different to CF and different to XQD and different to CFast. So just to be absolutely clear on that. Um, so the CF Express, they look like this. They're very good cards, very, very fast. Um, and that will allow you to use the full 6K raw uh, video functionality. When you've got so many images, you can transfer them much faster with a faster card. You'll also notice you have a duplicated set of controls. So you have a new, an extra shutter button, um, manual function button and dial here, as well as another dial here, and the AF on buttons and button, um, controls, etc. This is so you can shoot comfortably while shooting in portrait orientation. It also allows space for a much larger battery. So as we get to the bottom, this is the battery for the camera. This is an LPE-19, the same battery that comes with the 1DX2 and 3, completely compatible with the 1DX series, um, and likewise you can use your 1D series batteries in this. And going all the way over to the other side with the battery compartment, we have an Ethernet port that allows reliable and fast gigabit data connection um, for transfer of images. Uh, and you might want to use that for, certainly for the press guys and sports photographers that are wired into their agency's desks. They can be shooting and transferring images much, much quicker, quicker using that. And it's an incredibly reliable connection. Um, we still have a PC sync flash port there. Um, I don't think that many people will be using that anymore, but it's still there in case people are. Under this flap here, if you can see that, we have a USB 3 and a HDMI out. The HDMI out is a micro HDMI. Um, and we have a microphone port and a headphone port. The headphone port for monitoring audio. The USB-C, you can charge the camera using the USB-C. If you're using a, a power pack, for example, um, you would need to use a higher wattage um, power delivery power pack or charger. It, sim it won't simply work with most phone chargers, um, but it does work, which is quite cool. At the front of the camera, I flip it over to the front of the camera, we have on the bottom here, we have a little flap, and that is a three pin uh, remote release. So if you're wanting to step back from the camera and have the camera release via cable, you can put a cable release in there. Again, for this, you could also just use the Wi-Fi and control the camera remotely like that as well. And then here you have uh, two sets of controls, one for when you're in portrait and one for when you're in landscape. One of those is by default set to the depth of field preview button, and the other one is a customizable assignable button. They are both assignable buttons. You can customize them both if you don't use depth of field preview. So that's the outside of the camera, the back of the camera. As you can see, we've got a fully articulating screen that comes out and spins around and rotates. 
that allows you greater flexibility for shooting in difficult situations, as well as a lot of flexibility for shooting video. It is very robust and well designed, um, but obviously if you don't want to use it out uh, where it's a little bit more vulnerable, you can just tuck it away back and use it much in the same way you might use a 1DX series camera. Starting on the top left, you have a menu button and a rate button, which has also got a little microphone uh, symbol next to it. What this allows you to do if you've set it up is as you're uh, reviewing your images, you can press and hold that button to record a voice memo that is attached to the file so that when you send it over Wi-Fi or over an Ethernet cable, um, it then is sent with this voice memo so that if the person you're sending it to looks at it, they can listen to the voice memo and add that as a caption. If you tap the rate button, it sets a star rating to the image and you can customize how that works in the menu as well. Uh, down the bottom here we have a play button, a magnify button and a uh, bin button. Fairly self-explanatory, play allows you to play back your images and, have a, and review them. Uh, the magnify button allows you to magnify into them and the bin button allows you to raise. At the top here, the one I explained already, is a little toggle switch to go from stills to video mode. And then the record button sits nicely in the middle. We also have here the AF on button, which brings over one of my favorite technologies from the 1DX Mark III, and personally one of my favorite features of this camera. Um, it's a smart controller, which basically is like having a touchpad on the button. So as you drag your thumb across, it moves the AF point. So if I can show you that real quick on here, Hopefully you can see that moving the focusing point across the screen. I personally find this a really quick and convenient way of moving the focusing point. Moving over we have the exposure lock button that is customizable and most often customized uh, to a different type of focusing. So you use two different back buttons, uh, which I'll talk about later. And then the focus uh, mode button is on the far right. That allows you to go through different focusing groupings and to move your focusing point and change those settings. You have a little joystick with the multifunction controller uh, there as well, similar to a 1D series and an R5, but it isn't as fast as using the new smart controller on the AF1 button for moving your focusing point. It is very useful still for moving around the menus though. Info button cycles through the different information screens you can get on the back and each one of those can be customized. And then you've got the key button for quick menu. When you're on the black screen here that I am on, that allows you to access all of those uh, different options for changing settings. But if you're on the screen here, it'll bring up menus on the left and right uh, that allow you to change. It's a very similar grouping of settings. On the back here, we have a nice big wheel, as I mentioned. So this is the third dial and a set button to press OK. The on and off toggle is actually built into the back. It's a lot harder to knock, um, so it's much safer and you're not likely to turn the camera off uh, inadvertently with this. Um, a solid reassuring click there. So the big elephant in the room here is this large uh, new viewfinder. So the actual display inside this electronic viewfinder is basically the same as the uh, EOS R5 a 5.76 million dot OLED. Um, but it does behave slightly differently and it does obviously look quite different. It's significantly larger in this camera. And the reason for that is this camera has what's called eye control AF. And that allows me to pick my subject using my own eyeball. So where I look, the camera is tracking my eye and picks out the subject and it can track the subject from there. I will go into the eye control AF a little bit more in detail later on when I talk about the autofocus, but while I'm on the viewfinder, there is a removable eye cup on this, and there will be a group of similar accessories to this as there is for the 1DX series bodies. On the right hand side of the viewfinder, just there, you have the diopter adjustment. And I will say about this viewfinder that it is incredibly comfortable to use, particularly if you wear glasses, because partly because the viewfinder sits a little bit higher up uh, away from the body. It leaves a little bit more space for your nose. I just find it much more comfortable. And there's a lot of cushioning on that eye cup as well. On the very bottom, there is a standard tripod thread as well, just to make sure I haven't forgotten to say that. And that's everything for the sort of outside of the body. Let's dive into the menus. Okay, so to the menu. 
I'm going to start off in stills mode and we're going to talk about how the camera is set up in stills and go through basically everything through the menu and then I'll switch over to video and show you some of the differences there and um, a few bits on how to set that up. The video side will be quite short because most of the sort of settings in the camera are the same either way. So what I've done is I've hooked my camera up to a capture device which is hooked up to my laptop, it's just below the camera down there. Um, and that's how I'm going to be able to see what I'm doing. And that means I should be able to have a little window here with what, I, what I'm seeing on the menu. So red camera menu one, um, we'll start with that. JPEG and half quality is the first option here and that allows us to go in and set up uh, specific quality values for each of the different um, sizes of JPEGs. So you've got me large, medium, small one and small two and you can tweak just how high quality you want the images to be. This isn't relevant to most people but for some of the press guys this is important because they want to control the size in terms of the amount of memory each image takes up. They can tweak that in here um, as well. Image type size, um, this is the slow way of getting to this menu, there is a quicker way of getting to the uh, quality of your images and that's by using the Q menu. Um, what we'll go here is, what we're able to do here is set the size of the JPEG or HEF and then also set up the size of the RAW. You've got RAW and CRAW. CRAW is compressed RAW that allows you uh, some of the flexibility of a full RAW image in terms of editing but takes up less room. Um, RAW is obviously full and uncompressed. The JPEG and HEF thing, so H-E-I-F, is High Efficiency Image Format. This is something uh, that was introduced along the 1DX Mark III, I think, and the R5 had it. Um, so this is not a uh, thing to replace JPEGs. JPEGs are still available to you, but it is a better format. So HEF is a 10-bit image file format, which JPEG is an 8-bit image file format. So it allows more information, uh, more color depth, and um, while taking up less memory. It is the better format. Compatibility isn't amazing yet, and hopefully we'll get there and kill off JPEG, because uh, JPEG is an antique. Um, and it really doesn't allow you to get the best out of your images when you're displaying them. Um, cropping an aspect ratio down the bottom here, that allows you to set the camera up into a 1.6 crop mode. So if you're using EFS lenses, the uh, crop lenses for digital SLRs adapted over to this on the, using the adapter, which you can do. Uh, this will automatically put it into a 1.6 normally. But if it doesn't, you can manually select it here. Um, you can also use this if you just want a little bit more reach out of your lenses. You can just put a 1.6 crop and it will show you in the viewfinder a cropped image, um, which is one of the other really great advantages of the electronic viewfinder. And if you put it into one-to-one, -one, it will show you uh, the image in these um, aspect ratios in the viewfinder, which is really great. It makes life a little bit easier for uh, sort of composing images for a specific um, output. Uh, I'll put that back on full before I forget. Right. Red camera menu two. Exposure compensation and auto exposure bracketing. We'll go into here and this allows us to use one, um, whoop, use the back wheel dial here for moving the exposure conversation up or down. Again, this is a very slow way of getting to this in the menu. There is a button, dedicated button on the top of the camera, which you can press to set this up. So if I do that as well, you can see it allows me to do that. However, what you can do in this one is use this front wheel at the front here um, and set up exposure bracketing. So this will allow the camera to take one exposure correct and then one below and then one above. And you can go further into the menu and actually say that you want five images, you want two below and two above. Um, and this is for when you're in a tricky situation and you're not sure the camera's gonna necessarily get all of the dynamic range, so it's a very bright sunlight with some deep shadow. You can capture three images and combine them later or uh, just take three images at different exposures so that you can pick from uh, those to get the best image uh, later as well. I'll turn that off before I forget. Um, ISO speed settings, we can go into here and change your ISO. Um, also, you know, there are dials and quicker ways of doing that. 
However, you can actually set up your speed range so you can limit um, the, the range. So if you know that you don't want the maximum to be too high because you don't, uh, you, you find a certain level of noise less acceptable, you can limit the, the, the ISO range here. Um, by default, it is set to 102,400 as a maximum, but you can expand that up to uh, 204,800, which is um, H there. And likewise with minimum, you can actually expand that down to uh, a low 50. So that's the range if you're manually setting it, but you can also set up the range in automatic so that the camera when left in automatic ISO is limited into how far and how far, uh, you know, how much it can push the camera. Um, by default, again, that's set to 25,600. If you wanted to expand that, you can do. Um, that just means that you have a little bit of control over what the automatic system is doing as well. Minimum shutter speed here as well. So uh, this allows you to set the uh, minimum shutter speed. So if you know that the camera is often, when it's in an automatic mode, uh, putting a shutter speed too slow for you to handhold, you can just push that up slightly faster. Um, HDRPQ, so this allows you to um, put the camera into HEF, turn that on and the images saved that were JPEG will be HEF um, or RAW will uh, also work for this. Now, um, HDRPQ is uh, a higher dynamic range image. So this is where having a 10-bit image file format helps because you, you are able to push so much more information and get much more color depth and much more uh, dynamic range from uh, your highlights down to your shadows in one image uh, in HEF. And what it mentions as you go into enable is to set up the highlight tone priority. And the reason for this is, we can go down the bottom, highlight tone priority, what this does is allows you to uh, protect those highlights from blowing out at the top end um, because you've got that extra dynamic range. The HDR mode is slightly different to the HDR PQ. So HDR mode is for setting up the camera to take multiple images and then for it to combine them to give you uh, a sort of a stacked uh, image. So I'll go into that. You can adjust the um, dynamic range. Oh, there we go. So we can set up to sort of plus or minus one, two or three uh, exposure values. So if you push it to two stops, it'll take uh, an image two stops below, two stops above, and then combine that with the um, correctly exposed image. You've got uh, an option to limit the maximum brightness. So um, if you know the ones that are over are going to be too over, it can actually limit that for you too. Um, continuous HDR, this allows you to set up for whether it's just you're doing one set of uh, images for a single HDR image, or whether you just do this continuously again and again. Um, my recommendation is to leave it on one shot only, otherwise uh, you'll forget that you've got this setting on and you'll be wondering why it's taking one uh, taking multiple images every single time and combining them. Auto image align, um, if you're hand holding, this is quite useful. Um, it basically aligns each of the images uh, up. It will take them very quickly, so the, um, it won't have much to align, hopefully, provided your hands aren't too shaky. It is better to do this uh, if you set it up on a tripod, though. Uh, right, HDR ghost correction, um, that's a new setting. My guess on that would be the um, when you've taken multiple images and they don't quite align, um, you can often get a little bit of a ghost kind of, uh, ghosting sort of effect around something, and that will automatically correct that for you. Um, save source images, you can have it save all of the individual images as well as the combined image at the end, or just the HDR image that it combines afterwards. Auto lighting optimizer, um, this is disabled in uh, manual or bulb modes. Uh, however, what this does is basically sets up the camera to um, optimize the lighting for your subject matter, particularly important if you are shooting portraits and what it does is recognizes a face and will optimize the lighting for that face, um, especially in tricky lighting situations like this could be if the, wind, if the uh, sunlight was streaming through the window and my face was quite dark, it will sort of boost the lighting in my face. Um, highlight tone priority, as we mentioned, um, is there. I'll just turn the HDR PQ off. Highlight tone priority is there. You can disable that by default um, or enable and enhance that. So that just gives you a little bit of protection for your highlights and not blowing them at the top end. Um, I mostly leave that off. So uh, 
Number three camera menu, anti-flicker shoot. This is not necessarily anything that's new. We've had this in our cameras for quite a long time. Uh, what this does is pick out the flicker in artificial lighting, uh, particularly if you're shooting sports indoors, for example. Um, the lights are flickering. And if you're in burst mode, what can happen is you get very inconsistent lighting results. So you get some images that are quite bright and some that are very dark, some that are in, in the middle. Anti-flicker shoot slows the camera down a touch, but what it does is it picks out the peaks of that um, wave in the lighting and it shoots the picture at the peak every single time so you get very consistent results. The only problem with the anti-flicker shoot is as we're transitioning to LEDs they're often at much higher frequencies than the cameras that had the anti-flicker shoot could detect. So now we have high frequency anti-flicker shooting. We can go in, turn that on and you can set up to manual or automatic detecting. If I set it to auto detecting um, I can detect the shutter speed in my room um, sorry, the flicker in my room. So I can detect the flicker in my living room. It's noted a 100 hertz flicker, so I can change the shutter speed to 100th of a second. That way I'm not going to get any banding in the images and I'm certainly not going to get any um, uh, uh, inconsistent results. So you can see this will also be very useful in video because you're not going to get any flicker in the video too. Um, you'll also notice I can scroll through very specific shutter speeds when I have this turned on, that allows me to try and sync up my uh, shutter speed to the flicker of the lighting. Right, definitely going to turn that back off. External speed light control, this is very much similar to um, any of the other Canon cameras that's come before it. The compatibility is very similar to uh, all other digital SLRs as well as um, mirrorless camera bodies of ours. They have the same compatibility with the 600 series and uh, 430 and the new uh, is it EL1 flash gun. Um, the only thing that's different that came in with the uh, sort of 1DX Mark III I think and the R5 is this ETL2 metering evaluation and you can set up to face priority. So if you are having images with faces in there it can detect that face and uh, prioritize that for illumination with the flash. Um, which is very, very useful if you're shooting in fast changing environments like event, um, sort of events and, and press type stuff. Um, so here we can set up the flash, uh, whether it is on or not. Uh, the ETTR balance, where we have, whether we have ambient priority or flash priority. So ambient priority uh, allows some more of the ambient light to come in, um, particularly if there's a warm sort of candle lit or sort of warm lighting in the room, you kind of want more of that ambient light in. Um, or flash priority, if you want it to be pretty heavy looking like the flash was the main source of lighting, you'd use that, um, mostly standard. ETL2, as I mentioned, is the uh, sort of face priority thing. Um, you can set up the slowest synchronization speeds here as well, um, and this will vary based on the type of sh shutter that you're using, whether you're using a mechanical electronic first gun or electronic. Now this is the first camera in the Canon range you can actually use flash with the electronic shutter, with a fully electronic shutter. Uh, but it does limit your shutter speed a little bit slower uh, to electronic first gun, which gives you 250th of a second. This brings it down to 180th of a second. Um, still not bad, doesn't uh, make too much difference to most people in most situations. Uh, with the flash function control and flash uh, custom function settings, you need to have a flash attached to change those settings because you're changing the settings that are stored in the flash. Metering mode, you can go in and change from partial spot and center weighted and evaluative. Camera 4, white balance. You can go in and set your white, auto white balance, um, change to any of these sort of standard uh, set white balances, a custom one, um, and you can set up multiple custom uh, white balances on this camera, or move across to color temperature. And, oh, that is a wonderful change. You can immediately scroll through the color temperature, which you couldn't do, you so have to press info, which was a little bit annoying. Um, set custom white balance. So you can store uh, different white balances and what you do is you pick an image you've already shot and set the white balance based off that and then it uh, applies that to all the images you shoot subsequently. 
White balance shift, this allows you to shift the colors one way or the other. This is only really useful if you are shooting in t um, HEF or JPEG. Not that useful if you're shooting in RAW. The reason for that is uh, in RAW, you don't need to tweak the white balance quite so, so much. You can just do that in post-production. It's a little bit easier uh, and quicker to do so. Color space, sRGB uh, or Adobe RGB. So color spaces are interesting. The, um, this is the sort of overall amount of uh, number of colors, if you like, that the camera is able to use. Adobe RGB is a larger color space. Uh, you can shoot in either, if you're shooting in RAW, um, it doesn't matter. You can switch between these two afterwards. All the information is there either way. All this is doing is telling your software that, that it was done with the intention of Adobe or uh, sRGB, so display it in that. Um, if you're shooting in uh, HEF, then it will make a difference. JPEGs are sRGB by, by nature because they can't display that uh, amount of information. Um, whether Which one you should use generally is um, dependent on the type of work you do and where it's going to end up. Um, sRGB is the color space of the internet. The internet works in sRGB, so if you know your image is going to end up there, work on them in sRGB, shoot them in sRGB, and then export them in sRGB. It kind of just makes sense to me. It's less work. Because if you shoot in Adobe RGB um, and then you're allowing all other people's computers and browsers to try and, or websites to just guess what that color space is, if it condenses it down into a smaller color space, you get less control over how your images look to the end consumer. Um, so that's a very brief overview of color space. It's a complicated topic and, and is well worth looking into if you don't know more about it. Picture styles, so you can set up your own, um, but this is like uh, a look that's applied to the JPEGs and HEFs and is stored in the uh, RAW and is only picked up on if you're using Canon's uh, free RAW editing software, DPP. Adobe Photoshop and all the rest will actually ignore all of this information. So if you ever get your images, you take an image and you think it looks great on the back of the camera, looks a bit flat in the computer, um, you can, uh, the likelihood is you have a picture style set up. So on the back screen, it's showing you a rendered JPEG with that picture style on it. When you bring the RAW in, it discards that information and shows you the RAW and it just doesn't look as, as nice. So if, if that happens to you, you're better off using neutral or faithful um, and that way you get much closer to RAW on the back screen of your camera. Um, you have a monochrome one down the bottom and all of these are customizable and you can change them and set up your own as well. Clarity, there you can just adjust uh, the clarity of the images, basically like micro contrast uh, within the image. Lens aberration correction, so this um, is something that's quite useful. No lens is perfect, not even some of the best Canon L lenses. Um, and so it's well worth using this uh, as well as digital lens optimizer. Basically what this does is um, corrects for any imperfections in the lenses. So peripheral illumination correction is your vignetting around the edges. Uh, digital lens optimizer is a whole lot of stuff and that's with the R system actually stored inside the lens itself and that new data connection allows it to pull that information uh, and correct much more accurately for that specific lens. Distortion correction uh, corrects for any sort of um, incorrect verticals and, and sort of pinwheel distortion, that type of thing. Right, uh, camera on you five. Long exposure noise correction, um, as your, uh, sorry, noise reduction. As you shoot long exposures, the sensor warms up and you do bring in a little bit more noise. So um, it is sometimes worth using noise reduction in very long exposures. A uh, high ISO noise reduction, um, this is only really applicable to your raw, uh, sorry, to your JPEG and, and HEFs, but how much the camera reduces the noise in uh, high ISO images. And you can actually set up uh, an image to remove dust specs from subsequent images if you use the uh, software. Um, well worth looking to the menu uh, manual about that. I don't know that many people that use it though, to be honest. Um, okay, camera menu six. Um, we have multiple exposure and focus bracketing. Multiple exposure, you are able to take a picture and then overlay another picture and another picture and another picture. So you can create quite interesting um, surrealist type work with this. You can have it save all of the images or just the one, the resulting image, similar to the HDR thing. 
Um, you can set up how many images you want to use and you can even set uh, a starting image that you've already taken uh, if you like as well. So if you've already got an image on your memory card you want to start with, you can start with that and then overlay another one. And it's much easier to do multiple exposure on a uh, mirrorless camera because the images you've already taken are overlaid inside the viewfinder so you can see what it's going to look like before you've even taken the image. It's pretty cool. Um, different ways of uh, adding those images together, combining them. Um, it's worth experimenting on that. Focus bracketing, so this is for your... Um, when you're sort of doing macro work, it's very shallow depth of field and you want to get more depth of field and you've already stopped down your aperture. Um, what this allows you to do is take slightly different focusing increments. So uh, if you imagine I'm uh, an insect, um, I can focus on my nose and then set up focus bracketing and it will set up for, let's say, 100 shots at this particular focus increment. It'll take a picture there, 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 there and it will focus slightly further away each time. So that we get a, a, a sort of almost strips of focus all the way back. You can combine those images using uh, Canon's DPP software to give you a fully in-focus image from the front of the subject all the way back to the back. Obviously much uh, more useful for still subjects, not for moving subjects. Camera menu seven. You've got the drive mode. So you've got high speed continuous plus, high speed continuous, low speed continuous, and uh, self time of 10 seconds or uh, two seconds. And this is customizable. You, know, you can change the duration of your self timer. Um, with the high speed continuous plus, if you're in uh, fully electronic sh shutter, that is a 30 frame a second uh, top end. And um, high speed continuous was somewhere in the middle. I don't know exactly the number and low speed continuous drops that down again. If you're in um, fully mechanical shutter, that is uh, 12 frames a second at the top end. And then obviously single shot is just the one. Interval timer, um, you can set up similar to doing time lapses, that sort of thing, um, but you get every individual image as a full resolution image. So you can set up the camera to take a number of images over a certain time, certain time period and uh, a gap in between each image and you set up how long that gap is. Bob timer, um, what this does is allow you to set you up your exposure time if it's over 30 seconds because by default when you are in manual the longest exposure time you can do is 30 seconds. Silent shutter function, um, so this is slightly different to your electronic shutter thing uh, in the menu. It's, it is the same, the silent shutter is the electronic shutter. However, when you go into electronic shutter mode, what this camera has is a little um, a sound that is, is played over the speaker, um, through the speaker, which is a little shutter noise, so that you have an audible feedback that it is actually taking pictures. If you want it to be fully silent, you do have to enable this um, silent shutter function. Um, you will notice there that while it's in mechanical at the moment, if I go over to uh, silent shutter, it will automatically switch it over to electronic. If I go down here, by default, the camera is set up to fully electronic all of the time. Uh, the R5 and the rest of the mirrorless uh, generally tend to be on electronic first curtain, by default. Um, so electronic, in the past, what was uh, a bit of an issue with electronic shutters is that you'd get banding in the images if you're in artificial lighting. Um, and also it was more prone to rolling shutter effects with fast moving subjects. Now obviously this camera is designed for fast moving subjects, so that would be a bit of an issue. What this camera does is it employs a new technology called back illuminated stack sensor. Um, what this does is essentially t reads off the uh, sensor much faster so that you don't have the issue with rolling shutter um, and also basically dumps the uh, data it captures onto memory much, much, much quicker. Um, so you can shoot in artificial lighting without the risk of banding um, and it works as if it was using a fully mechanical shutter without, which is great for longevity of the camera as well because there's, less, uh, there's fewer moving parts. Um, and you can shoot as fast as you like at 30 frames a second for as long as you like, essentially. Um, release shutter without card. You should turn this off just in case you go out and shoot for a little while and um, you don't realize you haven't got a card in the camera. <laughs> um, it's a little bit harder to not notice on a mirrorless camera because it says up in the viewfinder that there's no memory card, but on a digital SLR that used to catch me out. 
Um, customize quick controls. You can change your layout of the quick control um, menu. So if you want it to look a little bit different, you can do so. Uh, and if you don't use certain menu items, you can get rid of them to make it quicker for you. Touch shutter. Um, this is using the touch screen to take a picture. So as you touch, it'll focus on the thing you've touched and then take a picture. Image review. So when you've taken a picture, how long it shows up on the back screen. Um, and it'll only show up on the back screen when you've moved away from the eyepiece. Uh, so it knows when you've got your eye to the viewfinder. And as soon as you bring it away, it'll then review the last image that was taken on the back screen uh, for your set amount of time. You can set it up to show the image that you've just taken up in the viewfinder. I personally find this quite annoying and so did a lot of people. So it was by feedback that they brought this setting in. It used to show on the original R in the viewfinder every time you um, release the shutter button, it would show you your last image, um, which can be quite distracting actually because you need to be looking at what's coming next. So on this camera, it's by default disabled. High speed display, this is great if you're tracking moving subjects. Uh, it just makes the display a little bit quicker. Um, ooh, and metering timer. So how long once you've pressed the um, metering button does it sort of stick to that uh, specific exposure? Camera nine, last one, uh, display simulation. Here you can set up whether it shows you the exposure you're gonna be taking um, as you change your settings. So on mirrorless, as you're looking through the viewfinder, as you turn up the brightness and like increase your shutter speed, um, the viewfinder gets brighter or darker as you change those settings. If you want that off, um, you can set that up or you can even have it set up to show only when you're pressing the depth of field PewView button. Um, by default, exposure simulation is on and it should be really. OVS simulation view assist. Now this is slightly different. Um, this allows you to show you a more natural looking image through the viewfinder. So if you're coming over from a digital SLR and you want it to feel as much like that as possible, turning the um, optical viewfinder uh, view assist on uh, will really help that transition. It makes it feel quite natural. The colors are slightly different to what you'll actually get out of uh, the camera at the end, um, but as it is with a digital SLR as well. So well worth trying if you haven't um, already done before. Shooting information display. This is the sort of information showed in the viewfinder um, and you can go in there and customize how much information is there um, and uh, or how little if you want it a little bit more minimalist. Viewfinder display format, you can actually crop in slightly in the viewfinder if you find that you're slightly further away. Sometimes with glasses, you're not quite getting the full view um, of the display. And display format, um, you can actually push up the frame rate through the viewfinder uh, to allow a sort of smoother image if you're shooting very fast moving subjects. Right, let's move on to autofocus. So AF1, um, AF operation, you have servo and one shot. AF area, you have spot, one point, expanded area. Um, expand area around and then flexible zone one, two, three. So they are like strips, one's horizontal, one's vertical, one's like a bigger square. And then a whole area AF. The only one I don't use um, basically ever would be the whole area AF. Um, it just doesn't offer you a great deal of flex, uh, a great deal of control over where the autofocus is gonna start. Now, this is something that has changed a little bit to where you're comparing to AC, uh, in, R5 or any of the previous R models is that in any one of these modes, face tracking is also possible. Whereas in the previous one, you had a face tracking dedicated mode. Um, th this works slightly differently. Um, so subject tracking is on or off and that's the face tracking thing. So you can be in any one of these modes and still have that. So this is a little bit like how on the EOS R5, if you, any of you watched that video, I suggested putting it into the face tracking mode and servo, and then setting up the initial servo start point. Um, that's what this camera is set up to by default. So they've listened to a lot of feedback from people and basically this is the better way of using the face tracking mode. Um, so they've set it up as default. 
Down here you can set up the subject to detect uh, people, animals, vehicles or none. Um, and then you can enable and disable the eye detection. If it doesn't enable the eye detection it will st still detect people um, but it will just pick out their head instead. Um, and you can set up the uh, readiness of the camera to switch subjects. So if you are uh, keen on it to stay on a specific subject, you'd have that quite low down. Um, and then if you want it, you're quite happy for anyone in the crowd to be picked out, as long as someone is picked out, you can have it a little bit higher. Um, so just to explain a little bit more about this um, face tracking thing. So how it works now, if I just change my mode and look over here. So I'm using the little um, AF controller, smart controller on the AF button. As I move my thumb across it, it moves the focusing point. And I'm just going to pick out this succulent here. And you'll notice as soon as I click AF on, um, or half press the shutter button, it picks that subject up and then just tracks that no matter what I do. Um, so that's the difference with this. And that is the same if I set up a different mode here. I can use a expanded area around. I can still move that across to the same sort of area and it tracks the same subject from there. If there was a face, it would pick out that face and stick to that face. Um, if you want it to behave a little bit more like a digital SLR, you'd simply turn off subject tracking. That way, when you use this slightly larger areas and you place them where you want, it will track subjects within that specific area. So that's the difference between um, how the mirrorless focusing system behaves to the way a, a digital SLR system behaves. And to be honest, if you're not using the sort of subject tracking, you're not necessarily getting the best and making the most of what this focusing system can give you um, because it's absolutely amazing at what it does. And particularly with, with this camera having so much sort of, of a bank of images to reference uh, within the sort of uh, motorsport area, it, it references images of uh, racing cars to so it knows what a racing car looks like so it can pick out a specific racing car. And it'll actually pick out the driver in the racing car as well. Um, so when you go into the subject to detect, you'll see vehicles down the bottom. And you'll also see, right, when I highlight that, it says info and spot detection. So if I press info, I can disable or enable spot detection. Spot detection is the driver. I don't know why the driver is called spot but the driver is called spot. So vehicles, um, info for spot detection, and then if you want it to be detecting the driver in that vehicle, so it focuses on him uh, or her uh, or that person, it will do so. So AF2, AF cases. Um, so this is the same basically uh, in principle to the R5 and R6. We have four different cases and an automatic one. So there's two variables within the cases. You'll see down the bottom, tracking sensitivity and acceleration deceleration tracking. Um, based on the type of subject that you're tracking, you want the camera to be ready for different types of behaviors. So if you know the subject is gonna be moving very quickly and suddenly changing directions, you'd want um, the sort of one case four where it's moving quite erratically because acceleration deceleration tracking will prepare the camera for rapid changes of direction or the start of a 100 meter sprint, for example. Now the tracking sensitivity, that works slightly differently. So that is uh, to do with how quickly the camera reacts to a change in plane of focus. So essentially the distance between you and your subject. Now um, the easy way to explain that is that if you're tracking a cyclist going across uh, the road or going past you um, and a lamppost become, comes between you and the cyclist, what you don't want is the camera to suddenly track to the lamppost and then try and track back to the cyclist. Um, what you want is to ignore the lamppost. So what the camera has is essentially a slight delay in when it will react to the change of a plane of focus, that distance. Obviously, depending on the subject matter, you want that to uh, be higher or lower. If you know there's going to be obstacles in the way, you might want that quite low. Um, it's not going to affect the initial pickup, so that first pickup of the subject will be fast regardless of what you have this set up to. It doesn't change the speed of that. It simply change, changes the speed of it reacting to different um, subjects while you're still tracking that subject. 
Interesting here is that you'll need to have it on quite high if your subject is coming directly towards you. That's a difficult thing for the camera to focus on. And because that's a constant change of plane of focus, you'll need to have the tracking sensor to be quite high. So pet photographers that are shooting dogs um, that are often running towards them, this is an often uh, something I get quite surprisingly often is they can't focus on the dog quick enough as it's coming towards them. And it's because they haven't got the tracking sensor to be ramped up to the top. So that's just something to note. Um, right. <clears throat> AF3, one shot, uh, AF release priority, and you can um, prioritize the camera taking a picture or giving it a little bit more time to focus. You know, if it's not in focus, is it worth taking? Preview autofocus, I'm not actually sure what that is. Um, that's new, I will ask and will write it in the comments. Um, lens drive when autofocus is impossible. Um, this is whether or not the camera continues to search for a subject if it uh, can't, um, or whether it just gives up. AF assist beam firing, if the flash or the camera itself has a, a light on it to illuminate the subject to help it focus in low light, um, you can uh, have this on or off. On the flashes, it uses an infrared light. However, because of the nature of mirrorless, infrared uh, illumination beams don't work uh, because they have an infrared cut filter, so they can't actually see the infrared light that those flashes are giving out. Um, which is kind of interesting. Uh, also on that, this camera can focus uh, in like minus seven and a half EV. It is insanely low light. So the likelihood of you needing an AF assist beam is very low. So it keeps you a little bit less uh, conspicuous if you have that off. Um, limit AF areas. You can limit the uh, sort of zones that you're using. If you don't use them very often, it just makes it easier to cycle through them. Um, the button that you use to cycle through your AF buttons once you press the uh, sort of focus mode button. Um, sensitivity on the AF point selection, you can have that on a very high or low. And orientation linked AF point. So if you move to some far left corner in landscape, um, when you go into portrait, that's probably not in the right place. So you can actually set up um, the camera to have the focus point linked to the orientation. So as you move to um, uh, portrait mode, it's in a different place because you set that up for portrait mode. Um, it allows you a little bit more flexibility there. Makes it a bit quicker when you're switching between landscape and portrait. So AF menu five, manual focus peaking settings. You have uh, manual focus peaking when you're in manual focus, it basically uh, puts a little highlight of color around your subject to tell you that that subject is in focus. You can set up the uh, level and how well, what color it is, so it makes it a little bit easier to see. Now the really cool thing is focus guide. This, is, this uses the dual pixel autofocus system. Um, when we go into manual AF, and I can, as I bring it into focus, it tells me whether that subject is in focus. And it also tells me whether I'm front or back focusing. So you'll see those two arrows go forward and backwards to tell me that it's in focus or not. Um, much easier way of working and particularly if you're a video, if you're um, trying to uh, focus on subjects quite quickly, you know which way to turn the wheel as well as um, it's more accurate than focus peaking because with focus peaking often you have to sort of check your focus, get it in focus and then punch in, like zoom into the image to double check it. With this, because it uses the dual pixel AF system, it's much more trustworthy, you know it's in focus uh, if it says it is. So this, uh, uh, with certain lenses, this allows you to um, switch to manual focus very quickly just by turning the focusing ring on the lens. Because all the new lenses are on uh, sort of fly-by-wire, they're electronically controlled focus rings, um, it allows you a little bit more flexibility to have this on. If you have this disabled, the next setting comes into play. So lens electronic manual focus. Um, whether or not the, if you have an electronic focusing lens, um, it's in manual focus at different times. So when you, in one shot, it'll magnify in to uh, help you manual focus if you want. Uh, again, the autofocus system on this is so good that I just don't see the need for that. Focus ring rotation, you can change the way um, the focus ring works on the electronic lenses. And the RF lens mo um, manual focus ring sensitivity, you can actually change the throw. So 
uh, you can make it very quick to change the focus with a very short turn or you can um, sort of make it a little bit more accurate and slow. Great for filmmakers that setting. Right. Play menu one, you can protect images, so you can go through and select a range of images if you like and protect individual ones. Erase images, you can go in and arrange individual images. Um, you can select ranges and new to this camera, you can select burst ranges. So if you've held the shutter button down for a little while um, on a single burst run and you know none of those images were usable, you can select that burst run and just delete the whole lot in one go. Really quick and really easy. Um, obviously you can delete uh, whole images in a folder and a, on a card. You can rotate individual images if you like. <coughs> and you can um, change the movie rotation information. So if you've shot an image that needs to be uh, displayed in portrait, you can actually go in and change that. Because it does have uh, portrait orientation mode video as well uh, built in. You can rate images, uh, copy them, and uh, copy them over to another card if you like and um, actually order prints in camera. I don't know why you'd want to do that. But if you set the camera up directly to a printer, you could do that. Uh, raw images processing, you can do a little bit of a quick edit. Uh, if you shot on raw, you can then crop it as well and resize it and um, save those images and then ping them off to wherever you need to. You can convert from HEF to JPEG if you have compatibility issues uh, and you need to send an image off quickly. Um, you can go the other way and put it back into JPEG. Um, you can start a slideshow, but it's particularly useful if you've connected up via uh, micro uh, HDMI to a TV or something. And uh, set up the magnification, the sort of default magnification when you hit the magnify button. Uh, because it can be quicker if you know when you only use the magnify button to check focus, uh, you can set that up to 10 times um, magnification so it immediately punches right in and you can also have it focusing directly on where the focus point was was when you took the picture as well which is really cool so you just punch straight into the eye then um, so you know whether the eye is in focus uh, right so camera man, um, sorry playback menu four how many the images the camera jumps to when you use the front dial on your little finger there on your index finger uh, that does make it quicker to cycle through a large number of images. You can um, image jump with the rate, so you can jump through um, specific burst like groupings, as I mentioned, as well. You can switch to front and back dials as well, if you wanted to. I don't know why you'd want to do that. Uh, rate button, you can change the rate button to, um, as I mentioned earlier, you can actually change whether it does the, the, the sort of rating of the star system or just does the uh, voice memo. You can also use it to erase images or to uh, protect images as well. Um, the audio quality of your voice memo, if you're short on space, you can reduce the quality. Uh, it just makes it quicker to transfer as well. So playback menu five, playback information display. You can show how much information is shown um, when you hit the info button and cycle through the different info displays. Highlight alert, uh, this basically flashes when it's close to the sort of top 10% of um, getting close to blowing out the highlights or if it is blown out. Um, AF point display, uh, it'll show you a little red dot where it was um, actually in, where it thought it should be in focus. Uh, playback grid, it shows a grid over the images to help with composition. Um, movie playback count, um, just changes whether if you're using time code, very few people do. HDR, HDR out. Um, you can play back HDR to a TV. So if you if you have a HDR compatible de display device, you can actually show uh, a full HDR image in playback. Okay. So moving on to the networking, this camera has uh, built-in five gigahertz and two point four gigahertz Wi-Fi. Um, it's fully compatible with sort of FTP settings and very similar to so very similar to what you get out of a 1DX with a WFT or uh, the 1DX3 with the built-in Wi-Fi. Um, this camera is capable of very fast and reliable connection to um, your Wi-Fi device or your mobile device, but you can actually also do this cable. So you can also connect up via cable and ping off to uh, FTP servers via uh, a cable. So it has 
Apple's MFI certification too. Um, you can upload to a web service, so you can set up uh, a Canon web service cloud storage system, so you can upload your images as you shoot them as well. Um, I'm not going to go into how to set up the Wi-Fi because it's, it's quite a, a time-consuming thing to show if you're talking about FTP. FTP is a whole other video on its own. Uh, the basic Wi-Fi to connect to a device is fairly simple. So you can set up lots of different settings for different devices. Um, and then there's a wizard to help you set it up. So you can configure offline or online. So I'll configure this on online. FTP, EOS Utility, Browser Remote and Smartphone. So I can use a browser remote system to control the camera using a web browser. Um, and that could be any kind of device. So it just sets up a hotspot for me. I can connect to that hotspot, uh, go to the address, web address, um, and then control the camera like that. EOS Utility, if you're using Canon software, um, it'll pick it up and then smartphone as well. Um, and then you just follow the instructions in there. You can also save your connection settings to a card and reload them. So if, you're, if you have multiple R3s, you can uh, save your settings. Um, also quite useful, you can sync your time between multiple cameras if you uh, have multiple on a, on a network. very useful for you press guys. Um, so Bluetooth is also there, so you can actually use the camera to um, use a Bluetooth remote to take pictures, but also to have an always-on connection with the camera, which you can use to turn on the Wi-Fi. So if you um, bring out your phone and it's paired via that Bluetooth, you can just turn the f uh, open the app up and it'll turn the Wi-Fi of the camera on so you can view the images on the card. You don't even have to get the camera out of your bag. It's brilliant, so lazy. Um, GPS settings. Uh, this camera has GPS built in, um, and this is kind of one of those uh, useful things that uses uh, all of the uh, commonly used uh, GPS satellites, not just GPS, GLONASS and, and the other ones, I forget the names, um, all of them. You can also transfer images across, uh, basically change the settings, whether you're uh, sending just the JPEGs or the RAW and the JPEG. Um, and you can reset the whole bunch there as well. Okay, spanner menu. So the spanner menu is quite long on this, um, lots to go through, but a lot of it is very similar and uh, familiar to you if you're using um, a digital SLR or any other Canon camera. First one, record function and card and folder select. So what we can do is we can set up uh, in here new folders. So we can set up a new folder for a different shoot or a different room or whatever. Uh, you can also set up the camera to record video to one card and stills to another. You can set up for recording um, sort of backup uh, it from one card to another, so it duplicates it, um, anything like that. File number, you can set up to manually reset the, um, to reset the, sorry, automatically reset the, num the file number every time you change the card or just keep it continuous. We can manually reset it there. You can change your set up an individual file name, name. So it starts with your initials, for example. Um, format card, you can do that there, obviously. Um, and auto rotate. So you can auto rotate the images on the camera and the computer, or just the computer. If it makes it easier, so you can see it's slightly larger on the back screen. Um, and you can also add the video rotation information. So if you are shooting a video in portrait orientation and you want it to display in portrait, um, if you're shooting your TikToks on the R3, I'm sure a lot of people are going to be doing that, uh, you can do so um, and it will you know, it will show as a portrait video on your computer. Makes it a little bit easier. Uh, right, so you can change language, you can change video system from NTSC and PAL, and uh, although you know not that different anymore with most people sort of putting their content on the web um, you can change the help text size and enable and disable the beep which i normally disable immediately um, you can change the volume of the beep and you can go in and set up your volume of your headphones as well so power setting, uh, saving settings. This is something that isn't really relevant on the 1DX3s and the, the, the digital SLRs. I didn't have much in the way of power saving. 
Because the mirrorless cameras are always drawing power and often a lot of power when they're just idling because they're keeping quite a high frame rate refresh rate on the back screen or your, your uh, sort of your viewfinder even when you're not using it that can drain power quite quickly so what this camera does is it dims the screen when you're not looking at it um, and then disables the screen so it can turn the screen off if you're not looking at it for a little while and automatically power off um, and it actually what you'll notice as it dims the screen it as you're looking at it it um, really drastically reduces the frame rate of the screen the viewfinder so it's not actually constantly pulling power quite as much very useful in terms of battery life on this camera um, the the sort of CP testing that we officially state is something like six seven hundred shots or something like that I can't remember the exact figure which is I think very harsh it is much much better than uh, and it always is with uh, with these sort of battery tests is it's done in the worst possible conditions and it's an independent tester that does it in most people's lives they're not in the Arctic you know they're not in the worst possible conditions for this camera so it does last quite a lot longer than it states um, uh, I haven't shot with this long enough to give you a number but it, I shot uh, in a um, skate park all day with this camera and I think we only had to change the battery on one that we were using video the entire day uh, the one when we were shooting stills it was perfectly fine for the entire day right so camera menu 3 viewfinder and screen display you can set it up to switch from the viewfinder to the back screen uh, automatically uh, what it's done by uh, default is to have it on um, only the screen when the screen is out so when you bring that out it uses just that and doesn't switch to this the thinking there is that when you're using the screen out you're probably not going to want to use it use the viewfinder this is particularly useful if you're a videographer and you have the screen out for looking down there and things get in the way the strap kind of comes near the sensor for this and it keeps turning this screen off um, so by default it does it this way around the auto 2 has it switched regardless which is uh, slightly annoying and then you can set it up manually to viewfinder or screen and then set up a button to switch between the two if you like uh, screen brightness viewfinder brightnesses and you can actually change the color tone between the two you can uh, fine tune the viewfinder color tone if you find it's not quite to your liking or not quite natural uh, user interface magnification this is an odd one but if you um, if you can't quite read what's on the screen you can actually magnify the whole thing if you use this setting and the HDMI resolution is on automatic or 1080p um, fixed so I control AF this is again that, that new technology oddly it's not in the AF menu it's in the yellow menu uh, not really sure why but it's the eye control AF you turn that on and you can calibrate it now it is important to note that the eye control AF is designed to work with your eyes in specific lighting conditions so you set it up in the conditions that you are going to be shooting in so it's no use setting up at home with artificial lighting if you're going to be shooting outside in broad daylight it just doesn't really work like that how it works is six small very low power infrared lights are inside this viewfinder and they're looking at your eye um, they're looking at your eye and then there's a sensor um, reading that light bouncing off your eye and it can see where you're looking so it's tracking my eye um, but what I'm doing is I'm not using this to track a subject across a frame so when you're looking through and I can't show you this unfortunately because it doesn't show you what's the viewfinder thing through the view, uh, HDMI is as you're looking through you can see the normal white box that's your AF point that you can move around um, and you've also got sometimes if there's a face in there that it can see there'll be a grayed out box just sort of keeping an eye on that face and then you'll see a little yellow dot the yellow dot is your eye where it thinks your eye is looking and you'll see that yellow dot jumping about and initially that will feel quite unnerving because you don't think your eye is moving about as much as it is but it, it, your eyes scan across the, uh, the frame and you use it to look at your sub the subject you want to pick up um, and then you let the camera track from there so you look at the subject press the AF1 button uh, or the half press shutter button it will start tracking from that point so it uses it to pick up that subject and it will track that subject across the frame your eye is then free to look around and see everything else entering the frame um, and you can shoot away and then when you're ready to pick up a new subject or something else comes into frame that you want to look at you then release the AF on button look at that subject and then take 
uh, and then re-press the button. It will take some getting used to and it does need calibrating. And it is also worth noting it does work with glasses, um, but if you shoot with a combination of glasses on and glasses off, it's worth setting up different uh, users. So I'll show you on the menu here. In the eye control, you have calibration numbers. So there's multiple different calibrations you can set up. Um, you can train and refine individual uh, settings, set setups, uh, but it's not worth doing so in different lighting conditions, loads of different lighting conditions under the same calibration number. Um, it just helps within uh, you know, a specific area. Uh, the calibration process, basically what you do is you, you press that, put it up to your eye and you press the manual function button and you'll see a little dot in the screen. And then every time you press the button, it'll move the dot. And then based on where your, you know, your position of your eye relative to that dot, it kind of gets a picture of what your, how your eye behaves. You can go in here and you can um, adjust the sensitivity, change the color. Oh, it's orange, not yellow. My apologies. Um, change the color of the dot and what it looks like as well. Um, oh, I quite like the crosshairs one, that's cool. And you can reduce the sensitivity as well so it doesn't jump around quite so quickly. Um, right. Touch control. You can have that a little bit more sensitive, particularly if you're wearing gloves, this is useful. Multifunction lock. Um, you can, the little lock on the actual on button, uh, if you switch that to the lock in between on and off, uh, it'll uh, lock these specific things that you um, select here. On Shut down of the camera, when you turn it off, the shutter comes out to protect the sensor. You can have that on or off. And sensor cleaning, whether it cleans the sensor when you turn the camera off or not. Uh, it uses an ultrasonic cleaning uh, sort of vibration. And you can choose to your app for uh, remotely controlled via USB. So you can use the Canon app or use a sort of photo import um, app. Okay, spanner menu five, reset camera. Normally, resetting a uh, sort of camera like this is about six or seven different places uh, individually. You have to reset them all. When it says um, reset camera, it doesn't really mean reset camera. It means all of these individual things you have to go and do yourself. Um, on this, you can actually do a full factor reset, which is great for us. Um, yeah, much easier to, to reset. But if you, so if you find that you've done something, changed the setting that you can't quite figure out what's changed, what, you, what you've done wrong, go into this area and reset your, that specific area that you think that uh, would be controlling the thing you've messed up. If not, hit factory reset. You can't really go too wrong. Custom shooting modes. So this is the um, area where you can set up your mode, where you can set up your sort of, whether you're in manual with uh, eye tracking on or whatever, all this sort of stuff and then register those settings to a custom one, two, or three. Um, and the auto update set there is whether you, when you change the settings when you're in a custom mode, does it just store that immediately or does it revert to what you originally set the custom mode to when you turn the camera off or change the battery? <clears throat> you can save your settings to a card, much like you can on a 1D series. Um, you can check out the battery information and see if it's performing well. And you can set up your copyright information. You can, this is embedded into the metadata of your images, so it gives you a little bit layer of a protection uh, for copyright. And you can go in and see your, how many images this camera has taken, roughly, and uh, the sort of uh, firmware and serial number. Your firmware will look very different to this. This is an um, early model. Uh, that's just a find the manual on the internet for you. Yeah, so if you need the manual, you use this bit here, that's a QR code, scan that with your phone and it will take you to the manual. Um, things it has to have and firmware. So if you need to update the firmware, you go in here and put a card in and then with the firmware on it and go in here and it'll give you the options to do so. All right, so custom functions. This is the orange menu. Exposure level increments, you can reduce this, or sorry, uh, it reduces to half stops um, so that your moving through your exposure increments much quicker. Uh, similar with your ISO speed settings, you can do that too as well. So speed for metering or ISO auto, this is to do whether your uh, automatic metering goes back to fully automatic ISO after metering or it just sticks with what it's done for that, um, 
for the subsequent images. Um, well, it automatically cancels your bracketing. So if you've done a bracketing, uh, a set of three images bracketed, it'll automatically cancel that afterwards. Um, which order it does those bracketed images and how many of those bracketed shots you want. Like I said, you could do five, or you can actually do seven as well. I forgot about that. Safety shift. Um, this basically, if you set the camera up to slightly too high and too much of an exposure um, it, and it thinks you're not gonna get the image, uh, you know, and not be able to bring it back, it'll actually shift the image to a, uh, an exposure that it thinks is more likely to capture the information you want. Um, same exposure for new aperture. So when you change lenses and it has a different maximum aperture, the exposure will obviously change. So what this does is um, allows the camera to adjust the rest of the settings to uh, compensate for the change of lens that means that you can get straight to shooting uh, immediately. So this adjusts which of these different um, metering modes is locked when you half press the shutter button. Um, you can restrict the different shooting modes you use if you don't use all of them. Likewise with the metering modes. So in metering modes you use in expand, ex manual, um, obviously in manual mode you're not really using the metering but it does give you uh, a sort of guide as to whether you're uh, under overexposed on the uh, sort of bar at the bottom of the viewfinder um, and this just changes which of those metering modes it's using to give you that idea. Set shutter speed range, um, whether or not you're using the full range of the uh, um, shutter speed as you're cycling through it, if you don't use all of it you can cycle quicker. Set aperture range, similar thing. Um, you can ex uh, change the auto exposure uh, micro adjustment. So if you think that it's constantly kind of overexposing slightly, you can just adjust that. Um, and same with the flash exposure. If you think that the flash exposure is always slightly over, you can change that too, or under, whatever. Limit continuous shot count. Um, you can, if you're shooting continuous in 30 frames a second, you can limit how many shots it does in a single burst. Uh, that will help if you are a bit trigger happy and you can restrict your drive modes as well. You can change the direction um, of your dials as well. You can change the direction of your front ring on the lens um, and the sort of control ring on the lens and you can customize your buttons in here. So this is an area that's well worth looking into. There is a quicker way of getting to it as well. So if you go onto this screen and you cycle through to, oops, cycle through to information uh, to this cue screen, you can go down here to customize controls customize buttons and you can customize it all in here and it gives you different customization for uh, video as well as stills. Um, my personal favorite way of setting up is to back button focus and having two different back buttons focus so if I set up the exposure lock uh, to AF and then go back in there I can press info and set up a specific uh, setup for one back button or the other back button. So you can very quickly change the way the focusing system behaves if the subject matter changes. You can also customize the dials and what they do. So if you want it in a slightly different order, you can do so. And the bottom one here, uh, you can change to, uh, that's the control ring on the lenses. Obviously, if you don't have a lot of RF lenses, you can use the uh, control ring adapter on the EF, and this is what will um, change what that control ring does. And you can clear those customized settings from that point. Um, switching to, video or still. So this little toggle on the top that switches between video and stills, you can actually customize that um, to change to silent shutter function instead or just disable the video. Because if you know you're not gonna be using video, you don't want it to all accidentally switch over to video mode. So you can actually um, disable that entirely. Smart controller, the trackpad way of moving the focusing point as I mentioned, you can enable that or disable that and just have that in the uh, so we disable the vertical, the portrait orientation one if you wanted to. Oh, and that's also how you change the sensitivity of it as well. Go into Q and you can change the sensitivity. Because if you're not used to it, it does jump around quite quickly, um, but it's very quick to get used to. Vertical shooting controls, um, you can enable or disable those. So that's the portrait orientation buttons. If you're not using them, um, you can turn them off. Uh, custom menu six, add cropping information. You can um, 
add the cropping right information if you are shooting a raw and it just basically adds that information to the raw so you can get these lines on it that show you where it was cropped. Um, Shutter release, time lag. So this is kind of uh, uh, an interesting and important little thing. Um, with the previous cameras, the, there was a bit of a lag, uh, basically any mirrorless camera, there's a little bit of a lag um, on when you hit the shutter button to it taking a picture. And that lag is slightly longer than it is on a digital SLR, or has been, um, on, than it has been on a digital SLR, particularly a 1DX series. Um, with this camera, that lag has basically been eradicated or very much shortened um, to the point where the standard is the same as what it is on a digital SLR. Um, and it's consistent on uh, that sort of release time lag. You can actually shorten it, so in certain situations it can go faster than a digital SLR, but it's not consistent, so it's sometimes it'll be slightly different um, amount of time before it takes the picture. Usually still quicker than the digital SLR, or nearly always, yeah. Um, so if you need consistency and you want it to feel exactly the same over the shot, standard. But if you want it to be as fast as humanly possible, uh, you can actually shorten that. You can uh, change the audio compression, change what the erase button does, and uh, what the AV setting is without uh, lenses. So if you don't have a lens um, and you want to be able to set up, what? why would you want that? AV setting without lens, so this is, for example, if your lens doesn't recognize by the camera, if you're using an older lens, you can set the aperture on the lens and then tell the camera what aperture that is so it can do the rest um, and apply that into metadata as well. Shutter release without lens, again, um, if it doesn't have a lens on or it doesn't recognize the lens, uh, it might won't take a picture, so you can turn that on or off accordingly. Um, retract lens on power off, what this does is, um, certainly on this lens, as it's focusing, um, it kind of comes further out or, you know, in or out and uh, when you turn the camera off you kind of want it to go back in so it's protected. Um, that's what that does. IPTC information, this is uh, a whole bank of information you can fill out on your uh, on one of the apps or on um, EOS Utility to apply into the metadata of the images. So each of the shoots has a lot of keywording and, and uh, data attached to it as well. Really useful for press guys and, and sports guys. Uh, and then you can clear all of those functions. The last menu here is the My Menu. Within My Menu, you can pick out uh, multiple different tabs, similar to these, you've got eight tabs there. You can set up multiple different tabs for different types of shooting. You can name them and you can pick out individual items from anywhere else in the menu uh, to make it much quicker for you to get to the things you use regularly. You can also set up um, when you press menu, whether it just goes straight to my menu or it goes to the normal menu. So if you, if you set this up for getting to things quickly, it would be useful to jump straight to the my menu thing. So that's it for stills. I'm going to just very quickly switch over to video. So I've switched over to video. This is the last thing I'm going to show you. Um, so the video mode uh, in the menus is slightly different. You can choose movie record size here. We've got 4K. Full HD and uh, so we've got 4KD, 4KU and Full HD. 4KD is 4K DCI. DCI is slightly wider than 4K UHD. UHD being ultra high, high definition. Um, full HD there as well. You got 50p, 25p or 24 depending on the mode you're in. All I is every single individual frame is recorded. IPB is a compressed thing so it shoots a single image and then for a few subsequent um, frames registers the changes to that image so it's much uh, less information and IPB compressed which is even uh, IPB light rather which is even smaller. Uh, the IPB is great if you're not going to be editing the footage if you're going to be editing use all I it's less processor intensive. Um, high frame rate you can go in there and set that up and it'll, it'll uh, change this to using 100 frames per second or 120 if you're in um, the American standard. Um, and we can set that up for 4K as well as Full HD. You get 120 frames per second in all uh, in Full HD and 4K on this camera. High frame rate mode. Oh uh, yeah, sorry, I've done that. So, uh, movie record format. In here you can set up to RAW. 
and you go back in here and you can change uh, the frame rate of that raw or whether you use raw light. Raw light is a compressed raw, uh, gives a little bit more recording time obviously on your car so it doesn't fill up so quickly. And it is 6K raw. It does say 4KD there, and I know that's confusing, but it is 6K because you look at the resolution there, it's 6000 by 3164. If we go back and change it back to um, MP4 and show you 4K, it's 4096 by 2160. So it is shooting, I promise you, it is shooting in uh, 4K, in 6K, 6K, <laughs> getting confused myself. Um, you can crop into movies, so uh, you can use a slightly smaller part of the frame if you want. Um, if you want a little bit more reach out of your lenses, that's quite useful. And you can set up the audio recording to automatic or set your levels yourself. Um, so moving over to camera three, I'm just looking for things that are different on the video mode. So here you can set up um, uh, you can set up smaller increments for the apertures. So the aperture isn't in um, third stops. You can actually go to eighth stops. So it's a bit smoother to transition your exposure in uh, aperture priority. And you can also um, set up a slow shutter mode if you're in one of the automatic uh, video modes. So it automatically kind of uh, brightens up the image for you um, to give you a smooth footage. So moving across to camera menu four, that's the other thing that's different. So you've got here Canon log settings. You can go into Canon log. C log three is built into this camera. Um, that gives you a little bit more dynamic range or a lot more dynamic range actually. But it does give you a flatter image, so it is worth, uh, you know, then you do need to uh, uh, grade the images afterwards. And moving across to camera six, you have movie self timer. You can actually set up a self timer before the movie starts recording. So if you're self shooting, you can go and press the record button, step back, and, uh, and then the camera will start the recording. Uh, you can also enable the remote control for video recording. And here we have some video uh, functionality. So image stabilizer mode, uh, it can use the digital image, image stabilizer. Um, so this is on top of the inbuilt image stabilization that's in the camera, as well as the stabilization that's in the lens. This is actually crops into the image slightly and then moves that around the sensor to give you even more image stabilization uh, should you need it. You can change what the shutter button function. Uh, you can change what the shutter button does when you're shooting films, as well, and you can set up zebra. So zebra is a pattern that shows up on the display. It isn't saved in the video, but it just gives you an idea of uh, how your exposure is doing and if you're blowing the exposure at the top end. Shooting menu eight. You have time code as well. So if you're shooting with multiple cameras, you can set up time code. Um, so that you are, you know that they are all synced and you can find the footage um, across multiple cameras much easier. Um, whether or not the playback and menus are displayed on the screens of both the device and the HDMI connected um, device as well. Useful. Okay, going across to uh, AF, you have movie servo AF, um, whether it's just continually tracking um, the subjects or not. Much of the rest of this is very similar. Um, servo autofocus speed, uh, you can actually push up the autofocus speed or slow it down. So if you're tapping to focus on one thing or another, you can actually slow the focusing down a little bit so you get a nice smooth pull focus effect. Um, and you can increase or decrease the tracking sensitivity, much like I said about the uh, cases Obviously, cases aren't quite as relevant on this, so you just get the individual uh, variable. Um, a lot of the rest is basically the same um, as what you'd get in the stills. One last thing I didn't mention is the image stabilizer. So this camera does have uh, full image stabilization built into the camera body. The sensor is stabilized, um, and this gives you up to eight stops of image stabilization, which is absolutely amazing. Um, there isn't, it didn't come up in the menu because the lens I have has image stabilizer built into it. And if it's on that, um, then there's a switch on the lens that says IS on or off. If the IS is on on the lens, then it's on in the camera. Um, and likewise, if it's off, it's off in the camera. Uh, if I, now I've taken that lens off the camera body, um, I can show you the menu again. 
Um, and in camera eight, we have image stabilizer mode. I can go in there and change whether it's on or off. I can change whether the, so still in photo image stabilization, whether it's on all the time while you're looking through and, and composing your image or when it's on just when you're taking the picture. You can also set up the focal length. So this is useful if the lenses you're using aren't recognized by the camera. If they don't have a chip in it, it can't read the lenses there. So you can set up the focal length and it'll optimize the stabilization for that focal length. If you're using a Canon lens that doesn't have image stabilization, uh, it will automatically recognize the focal length anyway, so you don't need to do this, but it's just in case you're using sort of older lenses adapted over. That's it. So that was uh, the entire menu system of the Canon EOS R3. Um, I appreciate that was a long video and I didn't really go into my experience of using the camera. Um, I have had a chance to shoot with it out in uh, a skate park with a BMXer and it was staggering. It was incredibly fast and just tracked the subject, just stuck onto the subject like glue. And uh, even when he was sort of flipping and turning around, it would just go onto his body or back onto his face. Um, but I'm sure there's gonna be plenty of videos out there coming about people using this camera. Um, so I just wanted to give you an opportunity to have a sort of video manual, if you like, for the entire uh, system. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks for joining me. Um, I've been Raj K and you can find me on Instagram at rajk.photo or uh, here on YouTube as well. Um, my channel has been a little bit neglected, but well worth finding me on there. You can also send me a message if you'd like. Cheers, have a good one, goodbye.